Hello. Okay. I was going to wait till October to start this, but I figured, oh, well, what the heck, <laughs> I started. This is a discussion, lecture, talk, feature, presentation, whatever you want to call it, of something I'm calling nationalism chain reaction. Uh, and it's about the chain reaction caused by different incidences of nationalism in Europe after 1815. I do have this Abita client select. It's a special beer that was made for a law firm, not for sale to the public. Someone forwarded it to me, eight bottles. I've been drinking it. If somebody wants some, I'm gonna bring it to him. He's gonna pick it up tomorrow. Um, and we're gonna trade. I can't figure out what kind of beer it is. I think it it's something like um, an English ale similar to a Fuller's London Pride. It seems like the ABV is around 6%. It's not too filtered. It's a little murky. It's bubbly. This is, I know it's not the right glass, but uh, it's got that bone colored head. It's just got that English ale aroma and flavor, but I could be totally wrong. Um, Shows you what I know. Anyway, uh, it tastes great, though. It's funny. One of the best beers a Bita makes, and you can't buy it. <laughs> like I said, they must save their best for their best clients. Anyway, back to the main topic. Uh, we go to, really, you have to go back to 1789, July 14, 1789. And I may stand up during this video and move the camera because this and it's going to be too long, I think, for one video. I'm going to go an hour and then I'll stop. I don't see how possibly it could be done in one hour. Um, but you go to 1789. In a lot of ways, that's the end of the feudal, the era of feudalism, really, because when the French Revolution started, or more accurately, the World Revolution in France, okay, because it was really set up to be a world revolution it just happened to start in france they had tried to launch it in in some ways in the german states of the empire but being a lot stricter they were run out or suppressed but france was on paper a very dictatorial sort of absolute monarchy in reality it was the most liberal country in europe and you could pretty much do what you wanted without getting in a whole lot of trouble frankly but um so it's sort of a good place to start a revolution, a world revolution. We had a development of nation states before July 14, 14 1789, there's no doubt. You had uh, the Russian Empire, the Russias being established, independent of the, the Khans, right, that was originally you know the mongols that came in in the 1200s and um you had the frankish people the franks france a nation state to a large extent although france still had a lot of feudal features they were all french people more or less but uh the king in many ways shared power with lords and the French um, provinces had a lot of independence, but there was some net nationality there. Spain was a bit of a nation state under the kingdom of Spain. Castilians ruled, you know, it was sort of like Castilian Spanish. There's a problem today with that. Oh, Catalonians breaking away. Uh, Portugal was certainly a nation state. But and the Danish kingdom and Sweden. And I guess you'd say the Dutch. The Dutch broke away from the, well, of course the Dutch had seceded and finally formally breaking away from Spain in 1648. And uh, the English had had their growing uh, empire over the British Isles and eventually, eventually by 1789, of course, around the world. But 
up until 1789, there was, to a large extent, not really nation states. There were kingdoms who ruled, ruled over various, various nationalities. The French Revolution was really, an, the revolution in France was really an attempt to overthrow all existing religious and um, governmental institutions and to set up what people might call today a new world order, a brotherhood of man independent of, of uh, nas nations, of uh, governments and um, religions, sort of like a, in some ways like this utopia or like you read in these science fiction novels, except they were trying to make it fact around the world. But anyway, I'll, I'll get, we're not going to get into that too much. What do we know? The revolutionaries failed in some ways because um, they couldn't, like the socialists today, and of course we know socialism came from the French Revolution, basically, and communism, but they couldn't agree on how to pro pro progress with the revolution. They did want to overthrow the monarchy, but then you had the Girondists that said, well, we can keep the king as a figurehead and um, just have the revolution through this formal monarchy. Keep it on paper. And then you had the the moderates say, mm, maybe that's a good idea. And, and then you had the Jacobins, the radical, you know, the, the really the hardcore communists, you know, like uh, you say Maoist in China, they under Robespierre, no, 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 we have to, no, they said we have to cleanse France of all the old ways and set up a new world. You know, that's why they changed the calendar year zero and uh, start a new calendar and a new religion and everything. So they did a lot of infighting. Well, then, we know that through all the chaos between the revolutionaries, Napoleon rose to the top, and he was a more moderate revolutionary, maybe more in line with Girondists, not a radical. But, of course, he wanted to get rid of the power of the church, maybe keep the church around. This is a unifying force for France, but he wasn't religious, and he wasn't really, he was anti-Catholic, really. Uh, and uh, But have the revolution but what it turned out with napoleon and this is where it kind of leads to what it turned out with napoleon was he was leading this revolution you see and they're going to go free all the countries of the old monarchs and they start marching through italy and um the low countries in germany but then those people in those countries realized pretty quickly hey wait a minute napoleon is not here to really make a revolution what it turned into was napoleon was just there to make a french empire under the guise of some freedom, equality, and fraternity. The, you know, it wasn't about this so-called world revolution. It was about Napoleon setting up a French empire across Europe and trying to be the big player in the world. And the British say, no, if there's going to be a world, a new world order or whatever you want to call it, it's going to be under our liberal direction the tortoise is going to win not the hare so um they opposed that sort of transformation and of course they opposed french projection of power so it kind of went back to the old british french struggle of who's going to run the show in europe and in the world and we know that the british won the showdown with the help of other enemies of france spain the german states russia well, when Napoleon and the French conquered Europe from the, the uh, Polish-Russian border all the way back into Spain and Italy, that's when a lot of nationalism got started because he set up these like little puppet states, the Kingdom of Italy. It was really just, yeah, it was the Kingdom of Italy, Italian people under the control of the French, Napoleon, the Bonapartists, you know, the Napoleonic family. And then Spain, they, they just wouldn't go along with the revolution, and so they revolted, and they, they, they wouldn't play the game, and he had real problems with guerrilla warfare in Spain and the British supplying the rebels. The Germans, he said, oh, we're going to set up the Confederation of the Rhine, and we'll have this little German country finally, and it'll all be the Germans united under our control, you understand, on the French direction, whatever. And the German people said, what is this? <laughs> and um, when he made his invasion into Russia that failed 
that was the culmination of it. And then in 1814, he was booted out. He tried to make a comeback in 1815. That failed at the Battle of Waterloo, which in present day Belgium, and he was put out. Okay, so here we go to the main part of the story. Europe was in this, had been in this big convulsion, basically a war that had continued mostly on, sometimes off, but mostly on from 1792 until 1815. So there's lots of chaos. And the leaders of Europe said, we have to sit down and rebuild Europe. And people like the leaders of Russia, the, the Romanovs, the King of Spain, that's the Bourbon family. The King of France, the Bourbons, uh, who are allowed to come back in because they were always seen as enemies of the revolution. The leader of the Kingdom of Sicily, that's Southern Italy, that's another Bourbon branch. They said, we're gonna wipe out any revolution and we're gonna go back to July 13th, 1789. Basically, they wanna turn back the clock and pretend none of that happened and just go back to feudalism to some extent and go back to the good old days of autocracy. And they were called reactionaries, or that's what they're called today. And the Russians said, we should have the Holy Alliance. All these traditionalist countries unite to stop revolution around Europe. Now the British weren't too keen on this because if anybody was gonna run the direction of Europe, and you know Great Britain's attitude, it's gonna be them. So they were wary of like, well, what is Russia doing directing this? So we know the meeting was held in Vienna. Now Vienna was the capital of Austria, the new empire of Austria established in 1806 when they shut down the Heligus Romische Reich, the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation, which was usually led by the Duke of Austria, who always, the, the uh, Habsburgs were always able to uh, arrange it to where their family was elected, the emperor of, of the Rome, the Holy Roman Emperor, which is sort of like a cre recreation of the Roman Empire that never really it did make an empire in Central Europe, Northern Italy, and Germany. All right, well, that was done away with after about a thousand years. And so they said, let's meet in Vienna, kind of like the midway point between Western Europe and Eastern Europe, the old ancient German capital, Germanic capital. And so the Habsburgs are gonna host a meeting and that was canceled, it was put on postponement during the Napoleonic 100 days of 1815, but then they resumed the meeting. And so all the heads of state of Europe and their prime ministers, you know, the people that run the day-to-day -day operations of the government are there. The, the Count of, Aust you know, Count Metternich, Clemens von Metternich, he's the prime minister of Austria, and he, he was running the empire under the authority of the emperor. Okay. So his idea was to let's go along with what the Russians want, have a reactionary government. We cannot have these revolutionaries. The British didn't agree, but they did agree on the idea that they need to reconstruct Europe in a sensible way to where they wouldn't have this revolution breaking out, or hopefully it would not. And one, one thing they did was use the idea of legitimacy you couldn't be a ruler if you weren't a legitimate ruler. In other words, your family had to have been in power before the French Revolution broke out. Okay, now they did make an exception for the King of Sweden, the Bernadotte family, who is still the ruling family of Sweden today because Napoleon arranged for one of his field marshals, Bernadotte, to become the King of Spain, uh, of Sweden through marriage. And the Bernadotte dynasty was established. Well, they allowed them to, they weren't actually legitimate rulers, but they were allowed to stay because when Napoleon started to crumble, Bernadotte teamed up with the allies to run Napoleon out. So he turned on his benefactor because he said Napoleon's on his way out, so why not? Oh, well, he basically told Napoleon, sorry, chap, but um, I'm gonna stay with the winning team, so bye. Other guys made mistakes like Marshal Ney of France who was working for the Bourbons, but when Napoleon returned, he figured Napoleon's back in power, so I'm gonna team up with Napoleon again. He was executed for this treason. Now, um, but generally they reconstructed Europe according to these lines. So the Kingdom of Spain is back, Kingdom of Portugal is back in power, the Kingdom of France is back in power, pretty much along the boundaries of 1789. The Kingdom of Sicily is returned, 
Um, the Holy Roman Empire is not created, but we'll get to that in a minute. The king, the uh, emperor of Austria is back with their old boundaries, more or less. Poland, they, they decided to return Poland to its previous owners, the kingdom of Prussia, the uh, Austrian Empire and the Russian Empire. And Poland, the main part of Poland was turned over to Russia, the kingdom of Poland as part of the Russian Empire. Denmark was punished because they had stayed loyal to Napoleon and so they lost their colony of Norway. Norway was actually a separate country for hundreds of, a, 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 not a separate country for hundreds of years. Napoleon, uh, Norway was a colony of Denmark for hundreds of years, but they lost that as a punishment. And so, hold on a minute. So, um, have the windows open and I didn't want, I forgot to turn the air off. It's nice outside, dry air, low humidity, not too warm. Okay, sorry. All right, anyway, so uh, Norway was turned over to Sweden. So the, the king of Sweden became the king of Norway as that penalty to Denmark. Denmark did retain ownership of Iceland and Greenland. All right. They made a new kingdom called the Kingdom of the Netherlands, which included what we would call today the Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg. Now, um, Belgium, before the revolution of 1789, was called the Austrian Netherlands. So actually, Austria, way over there in South Central Europe, I guess you'd call it, owned what we call Belgium today over there in West Northwestern Europe, across the water from England. That was a Austrian territory within the Holy Roman Empire. But after the war, it was given to the kingdom of the Netherlands. Austria did not contest it because they were granted some territories in Italy as compensation, <clears throat> namely Lombardy and Venetia, Northern Italy. Okay. Now, what to do with the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation? Well, they decided they weren't gonna bring that back because that had been seen to, that was seen as an institution that had been dying out since 1648. But they wanna do something with it. They said, well, we'll make a confederation the German Confederation, all these states that have something in common, they speak German. And they'll be independent countries, but under sort of like a, not a nation state, but a, an arrangement where they would cooperate together. So there was no German flag for the Confederation. They didn't have a capital, but there was a Diet. We would call it like a parliament. And they would meet in different cities every year or maybe more than that if there was an emergency situation. So it's roughly along the lines of the German, uh, the Holy Roman Empire previous to 1789 minus the Austrian Netherlands, okay? So there were 39 states within the German Confederation of 1815. Austria, the German, now you had to be German basically to be part of this confederation. There was one exception, the Kingdom of Bohemia, which the central part of that, Bohemia and Moravia was Czech, Slavic, but that had always been part of the German, the uh, Holy Roman Empire of the German nation, so they said we'll make it part of the German confederation. There were some Italian areas down there, so we call today Slovenia, and um, uh, other parts of Northern Italy, but that was part of the confederation because it ran along the lines of the old setup. All right, but both basically German. And the main states were Austria, of course. What is Austria today? Bohemia and Moravia, that kingdom under the control of Austria and today Czech, Czechia. Prussia, the big northern German state that had grown from conquest of other German states. Prussia, but not East Prussia. East Prussia, way on the border of Russia. Uh, and um, 
was uh, never part of the Holy Roman Empire. So it was a German state with German people, but not included in Germany. <laughs> but you had Bohemia, Czechs inside of Germany. So there was some anomalies there. And uh, another other big state was Saxony, right north of Czechia or Bohemia. Bavaria, the big Catholic German southern state next to Austria. Uh, some other ones were Hanover, Hanover in central Germany. And Hanover was ruled by the German family that ruled Great Britain. The House of Hanover. So there was a shared monarchy there. The king of Great Britain was, and after 1801, Great Britain and Ireland was also the king of Hanover. Because these German states were made into kingdoms after 18, beginning in 1815. The Duke Duchy of Bavaria and all these things became kingdoms. The Kingdom of Bavaria, the Kingdom of Hanover, the Kingdom of, of Wittenberg, the Kingdom of Saxony, the Kingdom of Prussia. Well, Prussia had actually been made a kingdom before that because of a previous war. The Kingdom of Hanover. And then there were many German states that were very tiny, like Hohenzollern. They were very tiny. And they had some other ones, Thuringian states. Um, Luxembourg was considered part of the German Confederation, even though it was under the control of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, the King of the Netherlands. The Danish king controlled a, a, a northern German state, two states, Schleswig and uh, um, Holstein, Schleswig and Holstein. Okay, inside of Germany, but controlled by the king, Danish king. <clears throat> back to that was back to feudalism. And the German states were largely feudal, feudal states, really, even at this time. And they still had serfdom to some extent there and in Russia. Italy. Well, the papal, the papal states were reconstituted and given back to the Pope minus Avignon. Avignon, France, stayed part of France. That had been a papal state inside of France. But the rest of the papal states running around the middle part of Italy, that band, that little crooked band, which had been given to the Pope by Pepin the Great in the 1700s, I mean the 700s, excuse me, the 700s, like what was it, 768, went back to the church. There's only one papal state remaining today, and that's the very tiny micro state of Vatican City, but at one time it was many little states. Southern Italy, which is Naples, down to the boot of Italy, that Naples is like at the beginning of southern Italy, all the way down to the boot, and then onto the island of Sicily was a country called the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies, Sicily Island in the southern part of Italy, Naples. So that was returned to the Bourbons. Okay. And um, the Kingdom of Sardinia was a separate country, mainland Italy, and Sardinia Island itself, Corsica remained French and other little northern Italian states. So northern Italy remained divided up. Austrians, the Austrians continued to own Lombardy and Venice, Venetia. Um, then you had Lucca, Modena. Um, oh yeah, and Venice had been an independent country until after this Napoleonic era and it was now under the control of Austria. So Modena, Lucca, uh, San Marino and all these other little states. So, we didn't mention the Ottoman Empire, did we? No, I did not mention the Ottoman Empire because they weren't really involved in the Napoleonic conflict. They were a, a Turkish-controlled Muslim empire that had tried to take over Europe and failed. They had been going downhill for some time, and they were just trying to stay out of trouble. So they basically didn't care if a bunch of Europeans killed each other in wars. They just wanted to be left alone and control their territories, which was made up of many non-Turkish areas like Armenia, the Arab countries of Mesopotamia, what we call Lebanon, Syria today, Palestine, Egypt. And in Europe, they ruled Greece, Bulgaria, Romania, and what we call Serbia, Montenegro, Macedonia, and Croatia today. So they were basically just trying to hold on to their multi-ethnic empire. So yes, they were reactionary because they didn't want any changes. Why would they want changes? They controlled a vast empire stretching from the Arab, the you know, the Persian Gulf down to Egypt and into almost to Central Europe. So why would they want any changes? Russia. Russia controlled a vast empire stretching from Finland 
and Poland, all the way east to the border of China and Japan and Alaska. They actually owned Alaska. So why would they want any changes? They had a huge empire. It was starting to modernize. Even though it was still largely feudal, backward, and uneducated, they did want to be, become a modern country. But they had been so handicapped by 200 years of rule by the Mongols. So Russia had a long way to go. But they figured the worst thing that would happen to them is having all the little nations that they control rise up. So Russia, with their capital at St. Petersburg, wanted to continue to control the Ukrainians, the Little Russians, the Belarusians, or the White Russians, and all the other nationalities, Azerbaijanis, Estonians, Latvian, Lithuanians, Finnish, Polish, <laughs> and a whole lot of others. Okay, you see why I mean it's gonna take longer than an hour? Okay. So get this in your head. Now here's a map of the nations, the uh, nations of Europe. When I mean nations, I mean the tribes of Europe or the languages. They're all white people, mostly, but they speak different tribal languages, right? German, French, Italian, Basque, which is a tribe of people, a white tribe that no one knows where they came from. Here's Europe in 1815, like I was telling you about. You see the nation of Spain, Portugal, France, Great Britain and Northern, or Great Britain and Ireland, and then Russia to the east. Then you see in the middle that big kind of jigsaw puzzle, the jigsaw puzzle of little states, which aren't based on, to a large extent, upon nationality, but upon personal rule of a, of a leader, or, you know, of a monarch. Maybe a duke if he's minor, or a prince like in Liechtenstein, or a king like in Bohemia. Now, there's going to be two parallels of revolution <clears throat> all throughout the 1815 to 1914. The parallels are this. One is politi political revolutions. Maybe the reactionaries wanted Europe to go back to the old ways and have no change in government. It doesn't matter because there are revolutionary, what we would call societies. They were secret societies because they weren't going to allow them to exist, the government. So they were going to chase them, try to hunt them down as best they could. That wanted political revolutions of whatever extent, moderate or radical. So you still had your Jacobins oriented people that wanted to bring in socialism, or as Karl Marx called it, communism. And you had moderates that just wanted a republic, get rid of a king and have some liberal republic like in America, something like that. Generally, these were Masonic groups, continental Masonic groups. Okay. That wasn't a big issue in Great Britain because the kings of England were the grandmasters of the York Rite and the Scottish Rite, Freemasonry. So they weren't worried about a Masonic revolution there because they ran it. <laughs> but in Europe, that was not the case. Okay, um, so these revolutionaries, political revolutionaries, tended to be anti-Christian. Oh, I mean, they might be nominally Christian, but you know what I mean? They're anti-church. They're anti-Catholic. They don't want the authority of the Pope. They don't mind if they have a revolution and people go to church as long as they don't, you know, if they're just like blase Christians, whatever. It's like Napoleon was in, in that category. He, he said, we're going to keep the Catholic church in France and we're going to support the church. We're going to fund the church. It unifies the French people, not to mention we could control the church for our own purposes. So he was clever about that in a Machiavellian way. Now, the other revolutions are nationalists. This idea that the, all the nations, and when we say that, we mean the tribes, the ethnic groups of Europe, will have their own country. And this does go along with the political revolution, because the idea of the French revolutionaries was that the nation states would unite into their own countries, and then they would unite into the European Union, like we have today, but they figured it would work better than that. And then this would happen all around the world, 
and then all the regions would unite into a new world, like a United States of the world with uh, no religion to, you know, like the 1971 song, but um, so yes, it's true that Masonic bodies had a lot to do with nationalist uprisings. And most of the nationalists, not all, but most of the nationalists tended to be revolutionary in their outlook, socialistic in their economic outlook, and Masonic in their um, how they coordinated their activities. I think the easiest way to go through this exercise would be to go country by country. And of course, I would be interested in people's feedback. And I get some good questions from people. Well, let's go to Ireland first. Ireland was created as the Kingdom of Ireland in 1801. Well, it was already Ireland, but it was a British colony, really, their first colony. But they decided to integrate it more into Great Britain. They wanted the Irish to be more British than Irish. So in 1801, January of 1801, I believe it was January 1st, they formally, Ireland formally became part of what they now called the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. The Irish Parliament was disestablished, and now all the Irish Parliament PMs, par members of Parliament, I mean MPs, went to London. Okay. So they're trying to unify the country under one king and make a nation state, the UK. Now, some Irish said, oh, well, we don't care. That's fine, you know. But many Irish were not happy with it. When the French Revolution broke out, there was a lot of agitation in Ireland. And a lot of this agitation was being promoted by the French revolutionaries because they knew that the Irish resented British rule and that they could use that as a wedge and as a backdoor distraction to have the British off their back. So when the Irish Revolution broke out, you know, there was an uprising in the late 1700s in Ireland. This was largely supported by the French revolutionaries, the Directory and later Napoleon. It failed. It was crushed. But what do we know about the Irish revolutionaries? They tended to be anti, I mean, they were nominally Catholic, but they tended to have more of a French revolution, a Jacobinite, a Jacobin outlook. And that's why they adopted the tricolor flag. Because this is usually a symbol of the revolutionary, the Masonic revolutionary, the three principles, liberty, freedom from religion and monarchy, equality, and brotherhood, a brotherhood of man. So that's why they adopted the green, white, and orange flag of Ireland. And just like France had the blue, white, and red flag, which the Bourbons hated that flag they would rather the white flag. And that's why the anti-revolutionaries in Europe are usually called the white forces. And when they go around killing revolutionaries, they call it the white terror. The flag of the extreme revolutionaries was generally the red flag, the, re the flag of the French commune. And when they went around killing their enemies, they call it the red terror. So when you hear these terms, white terror or red terror, it usually doesn't re have anything to do with race. It has something to do with politics. Just like in the South, after the war between the states, you had the White League, which was white people, but they generally were looking at it from a bourbon outlook, a reactionary outlook. So they favored the ideas of the French uh, reactionaries, and they called themselves Bur the Bourbons. Okay, so... Um, There's going to be agitation off and on in Ireland all the way up until 1916 and into 1921 until their Irish Free State is established, really even after that, really until the 1990s. But um, the Irish wanted to have their own country. 
of various levels of independence. You know, the, now the revolutionaries can't agree always. Some were more moderate, so we could just have uh, a self-governing kingdom of Ireland. Maybe the British king will still be the king, blah, 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 but we'll have our own parliament again and we'll make our own rules. And the British will be off our back, won't have any like, strict trade rules and all of this, and be keeping us as like virtual serfs or slaves. And even liberals in Great Britain were trying to work against that. They, they thought it was bad to keep the Irish as virtual slaves and they wanted to modify that. So don't think that the, all the British wanted to keep the Irish in captivity. That is not true at all. So that was an agitation, area of agitation in the British, you know, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, the Irish quest for freedom. Not resolved until 1922, or you might say it's still not resolved today because Northern Ireland, okay, I'll go along with that. Ireland is still divided today. We'll go next to Scandinavia, Norway. Norway was part of Denmark, and then it was given to Sweden in 1815. And at first the Norwegians didn't say much about it. They had always been a colony, so they spoke Norwegian. They didn't really care. But as nationalism started to grow in Europe, they say, hey, we want our own country too. <laughs> and uh, the king of, naturally the king of Sweden said, no, that's my territory, what are you talking about? And so it just kept going on and there was agitation and mm, threats of war and all of this and songs and clubs and movements and operas and cartoons and blah, blah, blah. And finally in 1905, they made their move. In 1905, Norway declared themselves independent and they elected their own king and said, now we are independent of Sweden. We have our own king and we're the kingdom of Norway. Sweden thought about attacking them. The king of Sweden and the Swedish people said, let's attack. But then they argued and said, oh, to hell with those people. Let them go free if they want to go free. It's not worth it. Screw them basically the attitude they had, so let them go free. So in 1905, only 110 years ago, Norway got its independence, finally, without a war, although there was a threat of a war. Yes, Iceland declared independence in 1944, when Denmark was under the control of Germany, Iceland decided they would become an independent country, a republic, which Denmark always resented. They said that was bad form. You could have gotten independence after Germany was kicked out. You, you caught us when we were down and you declared independence. They had already been declared independent in 1918 under the, as a separate country under the kingdom of Denmark. Still the king of Denmark, but two separate countries. But the Danish people felt always, even till today, that it was bad form to declare independence during German occupation but it is what happened. Recently, Greenland was declared a separate country within the Kingdom of Denmark. That was on about page 35 and a in corner of the page, but it did happen. It, but it's still under the Kingdom of Denmark today. Greenland has so few people that it couldn't really ever function as a truly independent country. Even though it's a huge area and land, it has few people. Okay, Finland, well, Finland, they spoke Finnish, which is a language related to Hungarian. They might have liked to have been independent, but at the time there was no conception of this. They had been given to Russia way back in the early 1700s. And basically nationalism over there wasn't much to it. But during World War I, they did get their opportunity to declare independence from, from Russia, which was down on its knees or even on its back, so on her back. So in 1917, Finland declared independence. The communists did try to overthrow Finland and make it part of Russia again, but the German army actually went in there and helped Finland keep its independence. <clears throat> yes, that's right. The German army in 1919, after they were defeated in World War I, went into Finland and helped Finland. Finland did remember that, and they stayed allies. And even when the war broke out with Germany and Russia in 1941, you may remember Finland aided Germany, not because of any love for National Socialism or Hitler per se, but resentment against Russia and amity with Germany, who they considered their longtime ally. Going on to Russia. Well, 
the biggest problem Russia had in the 1800s was not so much nationalist uprisings, but political antagonism. And that is socialists trying to set up, or liberals of some ex of varying degrees trying to set up a new Russia. And the Russian, and even people within the Russian leadership trying to do this. You may remember the Decemberist uprising and all of this. So the Russian czars say, no way. There was a liberal czar, and, and um, he was murdered by the communists in the 1880s. And that's when the new Emperor Alexander said, if they want to play rough, we can play rough. We're Russia. No one can outmuscle us. And they started to really crack down on revolutionaries. And they identify, the Russians identified revolutionaries basically as a Jewish phenomenon. The Russian security services, they determined that revolution, communist revolution in Russia was a Jewish enterprise. Russia had a long history of antagonism towards Jews because they believed that Jews kidnapped Christian children to use in satanic ceremonies. You say, this sounds bizarre. This is actually a belief that was common in Europe then and even today, but it's whispered. There was a second attempt at a communist revolution in 1905. It failed. That's when the Russian government and people basically went berserk and said, if they want to do this, let's have it out. And there were widespread massacres of Jews across Russia, the pogroms. And they, that developed the idea that there was a Jewish plot to overthrow the world. And that's when the Russian government released the protocols of the elders of Zion. They said they had uncovered a Jewish plot to overthrow not only Russia, but the world. And we know that the government that came to power in Germany in 1933, in fact, not only believed the protocols of the elders of Zion and said it was not a fraud, but it was in fact true. And not only that, they used it as an official document and a teaching tool in schools to show proof that the Jews were indeed in a plot to overthrow the world. Okay, but Russia was not dealing so much with nationalism. Their nationalist crisis really came to a head in the 1980s and 90s, 19, 19, not 18, 1980s and 90s. But Russia did support nationalism in Southern Europe when it was the Christians rising up against the Turks. Okay. Well, let's go back west to east. Portugal, not an issue there because Portugal already had a nation state. They had broken away from Spain many years ago and they did have a political revolution in 1910, where Republicans overthrew the Kingdom of Portugal and set up what we have today, the Republic of Portugal, um, which at the time was a, a very conservative liberal government until 1974, when they had an actual socialist revolution in 1974. But from 1910 until 74, it was basically liberal in the sense that they didn't want a kingdom and they didn't let the church rule everything, but conservative in the sense that they were authoritarian and traditionalist in many ways. And they, in Portugal, tended to support anti-communist uh, movements around the world. Spain, we go to Spain. Spain had its own country, so there wasn't a whole lot of nationalist uprising there, except they had a problem with Catalonia, even today, thinking they should maybe have independence to some extent. And you know they had the problem with the Bosques, the ETA. But Spain basically was free of, of, of ethnic trouble, but Spain had big problems with political trouble, revolutionaries trying to set up a, repu a republic. And they kept having rev a revolts, revolutions break out. And ironically, in the 1820s, when a revolution broke out against the kingdom of Spain, it was the French army that rescued the king of Spain from the revolutionaries when in the past, under Napoleon, they had kicked out the King of Spain to try to make Spain a um, province, you know, a, a colony of France. But um, the reactionaries allowed this now because they said, this is the good French fighting the bad Spanish in their eyes, not the bad French. We, will, we allow the reactionaries to um, do this. Well, Spain continued to have these problems. There was another uprising later on in the later mid to late 1800s, and um, even they established a republic for a little while. That didn't last. 
Uh, another revolution broke out in 1931 where the King of Spain fled the throne and they established another second Republic of Spain and then it became more and more communist dominated, supported by the Soviet Union. And so in 1936, there was a Catholic, anti-Masonic, anti, you know, anti-communist counter-revolution and they rose up and they overthrew the communists, or what they called the loyalist government and these were the nationalists and that was a very bad civil war. The Catholic Army of Spain, supported by Portugal, Italy of Mussolini and Victor Emmanuel, and Germany of Hitler, against the Loyalists, supported by the Soviet Union. The British and French declined to get involved because they didn't really care to see a pro-Hitler or a pro-Stalin government win. So they figured that whatever the case, it was going to turn out to be a government they wouldn't be too thrilled with. In the case of Spain, the Nationalists under General Franco did win, and they remained in power until 1975 and he he decided upon his death that he would not his family would not become some sort of dynasty but he would return the the kingdom you know he would formally make spain a kingdom of again under the bourbons and that was juan carlos of spain and the bourbon family continues in power in spain today but under a much more liberal government <clears throat> than what franco had wanted but they do have a, a kingdom today Let's go to France. France is not going to have nationalist uprising because France was a united French country. So there's no purpose in that. But France's problem is going to be revolutions, political revolutions. Okay. Louis the 18th Bourbon. He comes to power after 1814, you know, 1814 and then finally permanently in 1815. He's the brother of the murdered king Louis the 16th and his nephew uh, I'm talking about Louis' son, but Charles, uh, um, Louis XVIII's nephew, Louis the Seventeenth. So now we have the Bourbons again, Louis the Eighteenth Bourbon. He died, and then he was replaced by Charles the Tenth Bourbon, the, the last brother. Now, Louis the Eighteenth was reactionary, but he was sort of moderate. Like he, he mainly wanted to stay in power, so he could say, "Well, we can have some liberal um, things." Like they, they, has, they continued to have the Bank of France, the centralized bank that Napoleon had instituted, and they kept the French school system that Napoleon had instituted. In fact, they kept a lot of things Napoleon instituted because they found found that they were more efficient than the old French system. So he just wanted to make sure the Bourbons were in power. But Charles the Tenth. He was controversial because he, he wanted to basically really go back to feudalism and have a hardcore Catholic authoritarian government. And that's when the Masonic bodies were like, oh no, and they started to have real trouble. And so in 1830, there was a big uprising in France and then it got so bad, the revolutionaries drove Charles out of power and he fled. The French communists, the commun now you know the old books say communists. Today they say the communards. But back then, during the time it was happening, they, they would just say the communists took over. They had a red flag. They were very radical. They would murder Catholics, just like you might drop a quarter on the ground or brush your hair. They took over Paris, but even they were too radical for most French people. So they decided they would allow Louis Philippe. Louis Philip, Louis Philippe of the House of Orleans, the cadet branch of the Bourbon family, like the secondary branch, considered much more liberal to come in and take over. And he said he was the he was the people's king. Now he was an arch politician more than anything. His main goal was just to be in power, sort of like a Bill Clinton. So he um, said, "Yes, I'm very liberal." let's have democracy and I'll be the people's king. But of course that was a scam. He was really just his own king, but he was more liberal than the Bourbons and he was the Bourbon Orleans, the branch of Bourbon Orleans. And But the revolutionaries, many of them said, oh no, no, we want a real hardcore left, left wing ruler. We want a Republic. And so they had pro problems with that. And finally in 1848, that's when the big communist revolution broke out all across Europe. It was sort of coordinated between the different Masonic bodies and there were uprisings in all corners of Europe except for, except for England, but Spain, France, Germany, Austria, Italy, really it looked like the, the Europe might be established as a communist empire at that time. But the reactionaries and the religious people of various degrees, you know, 
fought the traditional people fought back and the communists were wiped out in all the countries in 1848 and then that's when and now hold on I'm gonna take a little break to get some water and so here's a little short intermission very short <laughs> Okay, now, so, um, here comes Louis Napoleon, Louis Bonaparte, really, but Louis Napoleon, the nephew of Napoleon, the emperor, and he comes in and says, oh, I'm going to bring liberalism, and I'm going to defeat all these radicals, these damnable communists, <laughs> socialists, whatever they are, these reds, and he was very clever because he would act like he was pro-Catholic. I like the Catholic Church. I like the Pope. Not that he ever really went to church or he cared about it, but he was nominally Catholic. But he was smart. He said, well, those people, they'll follow me because I'll protect the church. And um, But he said, yeah, we're going to protect the, the capitalist people. You know, we're going to protect progress. So he took over as a moderate Republican ruler. He became the president of France. President Louis Napoleon, and but what he really became was a dictator, but a progressive dictator in the sense like a Huey Long or a Franklin Roosevelt. We're going to have a lot of programs, and we're going to we're going to be pro big business. So under his control, eighteen forty eight to eighteen seventy, France really advanced like more than ever. You know, progress. He protected the money interests, gold standard, and all that. So industry. De rapidly developed in France, railroads, telecommunications. France became one of the premier industrialized countries on the planet. France started to take over territories around the world, North Africa, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos. Uh, and so under Napoleon, it became a huge empire, but mostly overseas empire. And he basically made a truce with the rest of Europe. I'm not going to try to take over Europe like my uncle. I'm going to take over these black and Asian countries. Well, the other Europeans said, well, that's cool because that's what we do. So he was kind of like, you know, they didn't really mind him because they didn't perceive him as a threat. But he really was a troublemaker. So um, we're going to get into, no, no, he was not trying to take over Europe, okay? But he, he wanted to be a bigger shot than he was. He was kind of a big shot, but he wanted to be like the big shot. That was not going to happen because he was sort of like a bumbling kind of goofy guy. But um, but he tried to get involved in measured conflicts. But his main goal was to be a nationalist, make France strong, um, not be too radical. And, and that is one reason he stayed in power for so long, over 20 years. But his government did become progressively more dictatorial, mainly because he was having problems with the bourbons on one end that want to bring back the old kingdom, but they're a dying minority, right, at that time. Less and less people every year want to have the bourbons come back. But on the other end, he's got the radicals on the other end. They want a true revolution, not some capitalist guy who's in cahoots with the big industries. They want to, you know, they want, you know, the great proletariat cultural revolution. You know what I mean? That's what they want. So he's like, I ain't letting them people come in. All right. Let's go on to the Netherlands. Okay. After 1815, we have a new country called the Kingdom of the Netherlands with the House of Orange, the old leaders of the revolt against Spain. Protestant, nominally Calvinist, not particularly religious, as Calvinism tends to develop, they start off real radical, then they become kind of moderate, and then pretty soon they're like in New England, they don't even go to church. <laughs> they're more like practical atheists in most ways. And that's kind of like it was in, in the Netherlands. Nominally Calvinist, Protestant, but in reality, not religious at all. That wasn't the issue, really. They're Dutch. Okay, they speak Dutch, which is a Germanic language. Not a problem. Okay, then you got Luxembourg, which was given to the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Not a problem. Here's the problem, Belgium. 
Even the people in Belgium considered themselves part of the Netherlands. They always considered their country part of the Netherlands, but their problem was religious. They were Catholic. And they just did not want to be under the control of Protestantism. They couldn't stand it. And when the Dutch revolted against Spain in 1588, or was it 1570? Yeah, not 88. The 1570s, the Belgians would not help. They said, no, no, we're going to be loyal to the king of Spain. No, he speaks Spanish and we speak French and Dutch. But he, at least he's Catholic. At least he's Catholic. So when the Spanish were going rampaging through the Netherlands, you know, doing all these atrocities that you hear about, the Belgians were helping them. They were allies of the king of Spain. Well, they still don't want to be under the control of the Dutch. No, no. So the French-speaking Belgians and the Dutch-speaking Belgians, see, they're not, really a, they're not really a nation. They're not an ethnic group. It's just a bunch of French people and a bunch of Dutch people who happen to have one thing in common. They live in the same area, generally, which we call Belgium today, and they, they're Catholic. So in 1830, they rose up. When I get into the whole story, but there was an uprising, the Catholic Dutch against the Protestant Dutch. And they said, we're going to be the kingdom of Belgium. And the Dutch said, hell no. So they fought back and there was a civil war. The Catholic versus the Protestant. But the Dutch lost. And the Europeans intervened. And most Europeans, you say, what did they think? Well, most Europeans didn't care. <laughs> Why do we care if a bunch of Dutch people fight each other? So, but uh, they decided after a few years, okay, fine. Belgium be can become its own country. And they brought in a German family, Saxe, Coburg, and Gotha, to be the rulers. Saxe, Coburg, and Gotha. And later on, another branch of that family became the rulers of Great Britain. And that family is in control in Great Britain today. So the kingdom of Belgium is very closely related to the kingdom of England. But, uh, and they established a new country called Belgium, which has ethnic problems today. Now see, nationalism continues today over there because what happened? The Catholicism died out. Belgium is nominally Catholic today, but probably 95% of the people never go to mass. They're practical atheists. So they don't have that holding them together. So now it goes down to the ethnic problem. You have the Dutch who can't get along with the Belgians because who ever heard of two people with different languages getting along? How crazy is that? I mean, how could you ever get along with somebody even though you're both white, you're both nominally Catholic, you have a shared history, but how could you get along? And, it, and I've talked to Belgians and they'll say, oh, those Catholics, uh, I mean, those French, you know, those Walloons, oh, those Flemish, you know, they're Dutch people. And I say, ugh. I can promise you no one on this planet cares about that struggle. <laughs> like when I went to Canada, the French people telling me, don't you know what it's like to live in, in Quebec under the control of these people? I said, it's probably nice. It seems nice around here. Yes, but you don't know our struggle. I said, let me tell you something. No one cares. <laughs> and they were so indignant, you know, the French people in Quebec. You don't know what it's like. I said, not only do I not know what it's like, I'm like almost everyone else on this planet. No one cares. And then I went to the other parts of Canada and they say, and I knew some people from the more English parts of Canada. And I said, oh, I was thinking about going to Quebec. And they said, why do you want to go there? I said, well, I think there's a lot of nice things to see in Quebec. Oh, they said, there's a bunch of frogs live there. That's what they say, a bunch of frogs live there. So it's amazing that people of the same race can get into all these conflicts. So we shouldn't be too hasty to pick on Africa when the whites can't get along with each other. Okay, so we got a new country, the Kingdom of Belgium, which set up its own African empire, oddly, which lasted until 1962. Now, before we close out this current video, we're gonna have to make another part, maybe two more parts. If anyone's interested, I might get feedback saying, that's the most boring thing I ever heard. It may be boring to you. I find it very interesting. And it, you say, what's about, what about the chain reaction part? I think you can see that chain reaction developing. It's going to really hit this. It's going to hit its peak in Central Europe, really. You're going to see. You will see. But Luxembourg, the little German kingdom of Luxembourg, always considered part of Germany. Always. 
they both they speak Luxembourgish, but it's mostly a German language. Okay. Well, that little country continued to be under the rule of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. So the big part of Luxembourg was given to Belgium, but the other part, which is Luxembourg today, remained a separate duchy under the King of the Netherlands. Now, when the German Confederation collapsed in 1866 and they restarted the German Empire in 1871, they made a new empire called the German Empire in 1871, the, the states voted to whether, whether they should join or not. Luxembourg declined to join. They said, we don't want to join Germany just like Liechtenstein decided they didn't want to join. So Liechtenstein, which you may have never even heard of, it's a little country in Europe, and Luxembourg, they opted out. So they did not join the new Germany, the Second Reich. Well, what happened in Luxembourg was in 1891, the king of uh, the Netherlands died and a woman came to the throne. But there was one problem. Under the laws of Luxembourg, the ancient laws of Luxembourg, women could not rule. So that's called the Salic Law. So Luxembourg was cast off as its own country because of a dynastic technical issue. And ever since 1891, Luxembourg has been its own little grand duchy, not big enough to be a kingdom. Same thing happened in Hanover, the Kingdom of Hanover. Now, when uh, William IV died uh, in 1837, his niece, Victoria, became the Queen of England. There was one problem. Under the ancient rules of Hanover, women could not rule that country. So her uncle became the ruler. And so the, 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 it was still the same family, but it broke off into two branches, the Hanoverians in Hanover and the Hanoverians in England. And so Hanover, Hanover lost its personal connection to Great Britain, and they just were basically absorbed by the German Empire. So that's where their their ties basically died, ended, to, for most all intents and purposes. Okay, so we've covered Western Europe. Well, we didn't talk about Monaco, but Monaco is such a tiny little country, a principality on the coast of France. They are a country most people have never heard of. It's about a mile long. It's one of those leftover feudal states. Their rule is that if a woman ever comes to the throne, then, a, then it automatically becomes part of France. So they're desperate to keep men on the throne because then it would automatically revert to France. We also did not talk about Andorra, the little tiny country on the border of France and Spain. They didn't know what to do with Andorra years ago, so they decided that Andorra would be jointly ruled by a bishop in Spain and the King of France, now today the President of France. So Andorra today is still jointly ruled by the President of France and a bishop in Spain. In actuality, it's ruled by a what we would we would call like a town council, because Andorra is basically just a city state. It's just a little area that's not much bigger than a county, and it basically is what it is. It's a county that is its own kind of country. All right. <clears throat> that you may have never heard of, but it is there and it does exist. And if they do have ethnic problems, they're so tiny, they couldn't even have enough to where anybody would care. We're going to talk about one more real fast, and that's Switzerland. Switzerland solved their ethnic problems because Switzerland, which had broken away from the German Empire, the First Reich, in 1848, they were declared officially independent, although they had been but officially independent in 1815, Switzerland, and they decided that each little canton, we call them counties, each little canton would have self-government. So they were a confederation of little counties. And so the French areas would be ruled by the French people who live there. The, the Italian areas will be ruled by the Italian people who live there. And the German counties will be ruled by the German people who live there. And they would all leave each other alone. And since they all kind of lived in their own areas, the German in the north, the Italian in the south, and the French in the west. It worked out pretty well. So Switzerland solved their problems with confederation, not trying to have a unified government that would tell everybody what to do, but very localized self-government where everybody could be left 
could leave each other alone. And so Switzerland basically did not suffer from any political revolutions nor ethnic revolutions. And so sweet Switzerland declined to get involved in any of these major wars since 1815. They did not get involved in World War I or World War II. And their official policy today is neutrality. They're friends with everybody and enemies to no one. Since they don't bother anybody, they never attacked. <laughs> And they had no interest in having an empire around the world, so they stayed out of basically all the problems. Plus, they're surrounded by mountains, and they have a strong air force, a relatively strong air force and army, so people just leave them alone. So it's an interesting little story and a good lesson. Don't make trouble, and you may not get any. Okay, well, the next installment will be about Southern and Central Europe, which is where all that real action is okay that's where the chaos is going to be and that makes sense because if you look at the map that's where a lot of the chaotic boundary systems are so that's going to be ripe for a lot of trouble quite a bit and it's going to lead to a whole lot of trouble that's going to culminate on july 28th 1914 and you probably know what i'm talking about and it continues on today even today to some extent. Thank you for watching this video production, part one.